So let me, before I go any further, thank Cambridge Assessment. And the two people I'd like to thank immediately are Simon Levis, whom you all know, and Gillian Cook, whom most of you know, and Gillian is uh, uh, happily here today. And we have much to thank um, you both for. In July 2013, we visited with four students and we copied, copied materials from 1858. And uh, we got um, perhaps 17,000 questions from about 1950 alone. So if you look on the first side, or the one side of your handout, uh, you'll see a, an image we took, which is of an exam paper. I think it's about um, 1988 from memory. And that was typical, the cover page of an ex exam, and then we took several images of questions in it. And on the other side is one of those images, and I'll speak a bit about that later. So it's a complete treasure trove, and we derive very much from it. I want to show you about that. And to thank for continuing encouragement and support, Tim Oates, whom we've uh, discussed uh, lots of issues with. We hope to go uh, forwards with Cambridge Assessment with Tim. And I can possibly thank him for this hard title that he's given. I'm not sure about that. So there's the title, Getting Teachers and Pupils Interested in the Really Hard Questions. I'm going to have to talk about interested as well, given uh, that these things are really hard. And I want to unpick the idea of questions as well. So um, everything I think that's new and certainly that's worthwhile is hard. And so I put, of course, physics at the top of that list, but you could put football, music, tennis, chess, dot, dot, dot. And with all of those, you have to practice. And if you practice, you get better. And if you practice incessantly and you're determined, you get to be quite good at it and sometimes very good at it. And some people are, um, are um, virtuosos and they are exquisitely good at it and they practice all the time. So a top pianist will practice eight hours a day, quite unashamedly. So practice uh, pervades all of that in a way that I'd like to explore. Actually, I've put uh, there that it pervades it for football, music, tennis, and chess, and somehow physics is just sort of hanging there, which is undeserved. Um, but we learn by doing. And the calling gets easier, and in some sense, the hard is overcome. So if I get really good at something by practicing it, I'm not focusing on that it's hard, I'm focusing on that it gives me immense satisfaction, or I can express myself with great musicality, because the mechanics don't defeat that. And I believe that physics, maths, chemistry, languages, English composition, essay writing, the whole lot actually, is hard in that sense, and will be less hard if you get good at it, and you get good at it by doing. So, mastery of techniques, fluency you get as well, confidence, they give us pleasure, and the ability to express ourselves in the media, and give you a deep understanding of the subject. And so, with music, it's quite obvious, you practice, you become fluent. When the mechanics recedes, you have the ability to then express yourself uh, with great musicality. But you better not be thinking about plink, plonk, like this. You have to fly. And that comes from familiarity. And I think physics, too, you get fluency, confidence, insight, and it comes from doing. And what do you do in the first instance? You do questions. So hard and questions sit against each other. Hard, I hope I've begun to unpack, and I'll do some more of that. And questions are absolutely vital. And then sitting underneath this, I've said, beware the council of despair. And that takes lots of forms. One form that I would uh, uh, say is, um, you shouldn't do something unless you're naturally good at it. Well, that, that's a terrible attitude to take. Um, and so it's fashionable sometimes to say of people, well, look, uh, you don't have any particular aptitude, um, so don't actually try. I think the, a lot of the satisfaction is, and success is in the trying. And there's lots of other councils of despair I won't um, <coughs> go into. So we had to confront hard, which has now got quotation marks around it, and um, our confronting hard was motivated by two things. The first is a skills deficit, and this was a strategic need felt by government. And it was government we asked, and we were given a very large amount of money uh, to, um, when we asked. We were quite astonished by that, but uh, we unfortunately got what we asked for, so they were to deliver. 
Um, and one of the facts, or some of the facts we, uh, we uh, put to the government was that there was a collapse in numbers of UK students qualified to enter top university STEM courses. And two um, are in the two of the foremost universities in the world for engineering. Imperial College, Electrical Engineering, in the year we looked at, they admitted 146 students, of which 101 came from outside the EU. And University College London, Engineering, General Engineering Science, not a particular one, uh, they admitted 575, of whom 280 were from outside the EU. And then you can try and backtrack and figure out how many might have been from the UK. And um, cynics would say, well, that's because the foreigners bring bigger fees. But that was not the case, and uh, I can read you out uh, the um, statements made by these universities. Um, but certainly, were it uh, that, then taking um, more, well, I'll let them speak for themselves if we want to go there. And in some sense, uh, just to sort of set the scene, I've been an observer of that since uh, 1986 when I started doing admissions for my college and I've lectured and examined in the university since 1987 and I was one of a small group that created the four-year course in 1992. We had to create a new physics course and as Tim was saying, uh, physics, engineering, chemistry went to four-year courses because of the profound changes at the beginning of the 1990s. So that sets the scene. But my real interest, I would say, is somewhere else, and that is empowerment. And I would perhaps say this is a personal crusade. I don't believe that access to, stop, to top um, Russell Group University STEM is fair at all. Access is anything but fair, and we've seen a lot about that in the press in the last couple of days, about social mobility, social equality, and access. And uh, I think something has to be done about it. And as I do admissions, then occasionally my heart is broken by what I see. So I, I feel this very strongly. And it became intensified as my own children came to this admissions uh, stage. And uh, you, know, you do think about it. So we should think about outreach. Because outreach is where we try to get people into a subject, and into university, and into an academic discipline. So let me think about that generally. And uh, an important part of that, is, a necessary part of that, is raising aspirations and awareness. And there are lots of ways of doing that, for instance, telling people about the exciting subjects that they could study, and there are some very exciting and talented people who do it. And I'm sure everybody in this room knows who this is. Anybody not know who that is? I'm not prepared to say. No. <laughs> so you need a glamorous, uh, rock star who happens also to be um, a rather superior physicist. You don't need people who don't <laughs> have a person, so let me blank that out straight away. And some people would say, that's a colour photo, I just appear rather grey. Um, so let me back off that. I'm not putting myself forward in that. So you might ask the question, is it working? Working in the sense of numbers, of gender and of social reach. And therefore, is it sufficient? If it did work, then it would be both necessary and sufficient. But I don't think that it is. Gender, first of all. Of all state schools that teach any girls at all, only 48% of them enter at least one girl from physics A. So that 48% of the schools includes schools that teach girls, either mixed or girls only, who put one girl forward and 52% put none forward. That's a truly disgraceful and uh, depressing uh, fact. And I don't pretend to know what the solution to this gender problem is. The only thing I draw from this is that the people who do say they know and have been working on this for at least 30 years manifestly don't. So let me leave gender there, but it's an immensely important issue, and I have more slides at the end of this. What about social reach? Well, you can take as an example a very small college in the university, probably the smallest, 200 students, and to the college come about 1,200 target students every year. By target students, I really mean students from target schools that the university assigns colleges to in poor, deprived areas of London or elsewhere in the country. 
And so this tiny place brings 1,200 students there and then runs lots of external events uh, going out to these places and also um, extra events such as women and STEM events. So this goes on on an industrial scale, if you scale this up from the smallest college in the university to the university as a whole. And that's just Cambridge. And yet, stubbornly, these, the social outreach and access is not improving. And the other thing that one might worry about is, does hard actually cause this decline <coughs> in physics numbers? And this has been a, a thread through outreach for a long time. If you actually tell kids what physics at university is like, they will assume that it's mega hard because it's about black holes and so on, and they don't realize it's a linear subject, and they actually decline to be interested in physics. <coughs> so I'd like to explore that last aspect right away by looking at the numbers in A-level physics historically which actually then confounds what has just been said. A-level physics, um, in 1960 or so, 15% of all A-level entries were physics A-level. And, um, um, and, and the numbers from the early 60s rose until they reached a peak of 58,000 in the mid-80s. At that point, the, number, the percentage doing physics had declined to 9%. Um, and that was because although the numbers had gone up, the numbers actually entering A level was going up considerably over that period. And then in about 19, well, from that time, the percentage continued to decline, and the numbers, more worryingly, declined as well, from there to about 34,000 today. And to put a marker on this, the four-year course had to be introduced at this point because of the decline in standards. So um, I think you're going to see that the paper that I uh, pull apart is from this era here and looks distinctly hard according to uh, mo a modern view. And yet it was at a time when the numbers were um, in absolute terms high and the percentage was very much higher than the 2% uh, or so that we're at today. So um, I don't think hard is responsible for the decline. There is something responsible, but it's not hard. Quotation marks. So um, having looked at that, back to my crusade, why, um, what extra element is there? And I think that the element is empowerment. So Russell Group University is a selective. They select according to exam results, they also um, interview and they have tests and the reason for that is quite simple in some sense. Some universities that didn't previously have that need it now to award scholarships. They need to award scholarships because the £9,000 fee comes with a government structure that people from less privileged backgrounds should be able to get a scholarship to attend. So they have to dish out money. How are they going to do that? Well, they dish it out in large measure according to the skills, the insight, the mathematics, and the means of self-expression that they find in the students. And most students, or a lot of students, from highly disadvantaged backgrounds, aspiring to do STEM, the aspirations have been raised, have seemingly absolutely no idea what is being sought. So they're not empowered by the system. They don't have the skills and so on that these universities, they want to be inclusive, but they are discriminating at the same time. So raising aspirations, I think, is absolutely necessary, and Brian Cox is an essential part of that, but it's not sufficient. <coughs> so there's the hard bit, if you like. They're going to be able to do physics, and so I better return to what hard is and what doing physics is about. So here's the hard in physics, if you like. So uh, what is the doing route to understanding? What do you have to do in order to solve a physics question and thereby develop your understanding. Well, the first thing you have to do is read a text closely and deconstruct it. Now, I'll show you modern exams, which uh, I find a difficulty with, where this deconstruction is not needed. But I think in the real world, you're not given a diagram by somebody who's got a, a, a difficulty, if you're an engineer, and have the problem extracted for you. They just tell you what the problem is. 
So you've got to read the text closely and deconstruct it. You've got to convert your deconstruction into a diagram. Now this is very particularly physics or engineering uh, or mathematics. You think with a diagram. And you decorate this diagram with vectors, things with a direction, like force, velocities, electric fields. And at that point, the physics becomes, starts to emerge. You may have no idea when you got started, but as you get the facts on the paper, and as you start injecting your method, the physics and math method of analyzing it, then your brain starts working. That's the form of psychology that I've seen every day of my professional life, and I see it in all of my colleagues when we speak at the blackboard or exchange notes and so on. It's always going on, and it's something that one has to try and uh, learn from the doing. Then you decide on the physical principles which this um, psychological process will have become begun to inform, and sometimes that stops there, but most uh, usually you have to then start manipulating the above in order to, using a multi-step approach, physics and mathematical analysis, to get an answer. And then, when you've got your answer, you have to draw some conclusions, you have to put in numbers, you have to obtain a perspective by comparing the answer with something else. So there's some digestion involved. And this, I believe, is the hard, if you like, and um, it's something that can be learned, like learning the piano, but you have to learn it. So how do you develop these skills and insights? Well, I've spoken so much about doing. It's clearly doing, in my opinion, and in the opinion of my colleagues, that gives you these uh, skills and insight. So the first thing you do is you practice more straightforward questions. You practice and practice and practice as if you were playing the piano. And I should confess that I've um, been a research professor for many years. I do theoretical physics every day. And if I go on holiday without my research notebook, and if I don't do it every day, when I come back after a week, I'm absolutely useless, or more useless than usual. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm not shy about actually just saying that. And I don't think that anybody is exempt that. And I did my PhD with a Cavendish professor, Sir Sam Edwards, who once told me that um, way back. And I was eternally grateful for him to, to tell me that. I still find it an encouragement you know, all these years later. So um, this practice uh, will give you excellence in the um, A-levels, and we have a, uh, a book which does this, and here it is. Very cheap, easily available, and filled with 700 questions. I'll return to that, um, and one of its authors is in the audience, and there are two other authors. The second uh, thing is to practice graded questions at the right level and progress. One of the essential um, uh, essential components of the um, five plans for learning, uh, points for learning, if you like. And we are fortunate to have an immensely impressive and useful resource, um, the Cambridge Assessment Questions, and I'll show you how they have, um, have a new life now in a digital form. Right, so let me now uh, invite you to turn this piece of paper over and you will see um, the uh, qu the question, and I'd like to try and pull apart how once and for all in the physics uh, context. Um, so, you, those of you who are not physicists, just go along for the ride. Those of you who are physicists, you should really get your pencil and paper out and be doing it for yourself. But um, I'll excuse you. This once. So the first thing is show that a particle travelling in a circular path of radius r has an acceleration v squared over r directed towards the centre of the circle. So you start deconstructing. There's not very much to deconstruct. Here's a circle, radius r, the, um, and the particle is uh, travelling with speed v, and so I've just sort of indicated that going around here. So that's what the words tell me. And then I've got to now start injecting some ideas, decorate it with vectors and so on. And so here is a, um, a, a, a circle. I now, the first idea is that the particle going in a circle, its velocity is tangential to the circle. So I've drawn in a tangent vector at a time t, and at a small time t prime later, I've drawn in another tangent vector, slightly rotated. So I'm now injecting the ideas into this as I take my diagram and start decorating. I've started fresh so that it's clearer. I could just do it now. 
And then I can see that if I look at the difference between these uh, velocities, I get acceleration. Acceleration is the change of velocity, the rate of change. And so the difference of these two velocities is some vector which goes towards the center. The center will be very important. So there's an idea there. And I've written it down, um, and that will be part of my mental process. And then by a little bit of manipulation here, I quickly get to A is equal to V squared over R. Now that was, that was expected to be understood and derived by students under exam conditions when this paper was in currency. So um, I should say at this point, I think that the progression in this exam question is absolutely wonderful. You'll see a succession of ideas that link to each other, that involve participation of the student, decision making of the student, and so on at each point. It's a model, um, it's an absolute gem in my opinion. So let me uh, continue. An electron of mass m and charge minus e has a speed r, uh, v. It travels in a uniform magnetic flux density b, applied in a direction perpendicular to its motion. There's a lot of words there, and they've got to be, all the facts have got to be put together. Show that its path is a circle, and find an expression for the frequency for the circular motion. Show this frequency is independent of the radius of the circle. So this is an important uh, thing about uh, charged particles circulating in magnetic fields. It's how the old-fashioned TVs worked, and particle physics detection and so on works like this as well. So I should say at this point that occasionally we meet, or well, not that occasion, we meet teachers who are out in the field and they say, this dense text, that's absolutely terrible. The children will not read it, and so what I have to do is I have to read it for them and draw a diagram so they can appreciate it. And of course, the diagram does make them appreciate it, but the vital step in that they've been deprived of by the kind of teacher. So let me continue pulling this apart bit faster now. The magnetic field comes out of the page. You've given that. There's the particle of mass m. It's got a speed, a uh, velocity v in a particular direction. And, um, and uh, that's all I'm given. Now I have to know something. So it's asking me to know a fact, which is that the force on, some, on a particle which has got a velocity v and, a, and, and there's a magnetic field b is perpendicular to both of them. So you drop down an idea, it has to come as you get this diagram on the page. Um, and then the force is actually, another thing I have to know, the magnitude is the charge times the speed times the field. Now, the force is perpendicular to the motion. So there's the motion, there's the force. You immediately see the acceleration is <coughs> perpendicular to the motion when you're in the circle. So you've got a, you've got a circle there. Um, and so that the force actually provides acceleration. That's Newton's second law, so that's another thing you have to do. The physicists among you, F equals MA, force is mass times acceleration. The force is known to be perpendicular to the velocity, so it's just like in this motion here. I've got the, uh, the force, which is EVB, and I've got the acceleration V squared over R from the first bit, and multiplied by the mass, I've got the result. So there's a wonderful transition here. This is familiar territory for, uh, for the students, but they have to be able to execute it, and the ideas are being elicited from them one by one. Right, and then comes the fairground ride, which is the crux of this. Um, the vehicles in a fairground ride are supported by light cables with their upper ends at a radius r from the axis of rotation. The center of mass of a vehicle is at a distance L from the upper point of support. There it is. Um, explain why. Now that's me underlining here uh, in red. When the ride is rotating with angular velocity, omega, the cables are inclined. Why inclined at an angle theta to the diagram? Show them this. So there's, a, there's an important idea here that it's eliciting. So how do I go about this? I draw my own diagram. My diagram is better than that diagram because I drew it. It's part of the participation and the assembling of uh, my ideas. Um, the, oh, sorry. There's a radius um, <coughs> R here, which is this one, and then I put in the length L, and I've said, well, this is a distance R, that's that R, plus a little bit more L sine theta. I'm not just assembling the facts now, I'm sticking a new fact in that I've derived, which is 
in this triangle here is a bit of trigonometry. So I have to be fluent with trig. It, it can't wait. I don't have. I can't afford to try and uh, remember something that will come eventually. I'm like a pianist. I have to actually play, and it has to be fearless and uh, fluent at that time. And now I'm coming to the why. But there's an important idea being elicited by the examiner. So the tension T in the string has got two jobs. It has to counteract the gravity so these things don't fall down. And it has to actually provide acceleration to the center, like we've seen for the, the, the particle in the magnetic field. So it does two jobs, and this is the idea. So this would be my answer, if you like. A few more words here would be required to the question of the examiner. And now I'm going to do something, which is I'm going to take the tension and I'll resolve it into a part that goes inwards and a part that goes upwards. And those inwards and upwards have to do something. Inwards accelerates it so it can go in a circle, and upwards stops the, the carriage falling down with gravity. So there are lots of ideas coming in here, and you have to be able to execute them. So here it is, gravity, mg, mass times gravity, is the weight, is balanced by the component here, and do some trick, it's just got to come. And in, in, in this direction, the force, which is T sine theta, gives me the acceleration inwards, which is related to the first part of the question. And at this point, perhaps I go back a bit, at this point, some insight is needed. And this is, requires quite a lot of maturity. So this is where the practice, the 700 problems out of this book come from, and the equivalent of maths. If we look at the result we want to get, then we see that it involves the tangent of theta, no tangent sitting here. It doesn't involve the tension, no tension is here. It doesn't involve the mass, and there are masses here. So the student will then be thinking, well, how on earth do I get to this uh, expression, which has got nothing in it? And of course, the way, you know, if you've done lots and lots of practice, you realize if you divide one thing by another thing, the top line and the bottom lines cancel. And so if I was to divide at this by this, the t's would cancel and the m's would cancel, and the sine sits on top of a cos, and that's tangent. I've got it. That's what I need here. So that needs quite a lot of confidence and maturity. And if you haven't been doing physics every day over the last 10 years, if you're a physicist but doing something else, you'll probably actually feel that's a bit sticky as well. But if you do it every day, it's not that hard. So that's what I say here. If you divide this one by that one, you get a tangent, t's cancel, the rest is just what you want, and then you can rearrange. But that required fluency, confidence, and some vision. You didn't have to laboriously look up what tangent was. You knew at a glance that sine over cost, and sine and cost were just waiting there to be put one on top of the other. So it's a sort of feel. You're almost feeling one sits over the top of the other. Right. Let me come to 2011. And this is where I have a difficulty. Well, a... Um, a windmill is shown, because this problem is about windmills. Quite why there's a photo, I don't know, but it says each turbine converts the kinetic energy of the wind into electrical energy. 1.16 times 10 to the 7 kilograms of air travelling at 20 metres a second pass through the turbine every minute. Now, on the front of the exam uh, paper is the uh, formula that um, the kinetic energy is a half mv squared, and if I divide that by the time, I get the power. And you're reminded what the answer will be because we've given the units. And the only trap is that this figure was the mass that passed through in, in 60 seconds. So you've got to divide by 60 to get the amount of energy coming through in one second. And then you've got the power. And there are only two marks for this because not very much is being asked for. And there are no real decisions to be made. You are told that it's the kinetic energy. You're told the time is there, and so on. Then an expression for the power was given, which is a half A rho V cubed, which is roughly speaking right. And 
Um, and then you uh, are asked, or well, you're told that you take a log of both sides, and then you get log P on that side, and three log V on that side, and the three is something that you are given. The gradient of the line is three. So you're actually given everything about this, and you're invited to say, well, this is Y equals MX plus C, it's GCSE level maths, and you're asked to identify what this intercept is, that's the C in this formula. It's entirely just a formula, and there's no physics in this whatsoever. And then you're asked to work out the length of the blade for which you need the formula. The area is pi times the square of the length of the blade. So there's no decision-making being done. There are no physical principles being um, elicited. And indeed, it is in large measure just GCSE maths. And then this continues. Again, there's a photo. And then the diagram is drawn from the photo. I would hope that the student would have to uh, uh, draw this diagram, and <coughs> so on and so on. So the questions are broken down, they're highly scaffolded, there's no decision making, there's almost no physics, and there's no analysis really by the students at all. So the question is, can you bring this back? Let me go right back to empowerment. Empowerment says, you do it, you decide, you do the doing, and you get to an answer. Well, we believe you can, and this is our project to do so. Um, and it's a threefold attack on the physics issues that in schools would affect university and industry still. So the three prongs are the use of exam and other materials in a MOOC and a related book. So that's the digital component of it. We need to reach a long way and it requires a lot of labour unless you can bring technology into it. Then there are face-to-face -face events with students at hub events and teacher CPD. And I'll visit those three in, in succession. Um, I should say at the outset, we are a, a large team. Lisa and I have, um, I think, about six uh, staff physicists and about six computer scientists working on this. The computer scientists uh, deliver this um, MOOC, and they're also very interested in uh, education. And so under their tutelage, we've had weekly sessions on educational analyses of these kinds of uh, undertakings, which I won't talk about today. And then for the face-to-face -face events, uh, there are um, the, 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 phys the physicists are not only providing the material for this MOOC, but actually running these. And one of our team is in the audience, and I'll speak about him in a moment. So here's the, uh, here's the, uh, the, um, the MOOC. It's free, and I urge you all to go for it sometime and play with it. It's at isaacphysics.org. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's for students, um, and here it says learn. That's for students to try and learn from. If you log in, you get a full functionality. It will remember who you are, it will remember what you've been doing. It will suggest you problems at the right level. You can develop a portfolio. It will remember that, and we will soon make that available as something, this portfolio or summary of your achievements, which could be put in your CV or even uh, application to the university. And there are teacher functions as well, which our colleagues who go into the field, I'll speak about in a moment, um, of course, uh, they're very important. It's a national <coughs> DfE funded project. It's based in the University of Cambridge and it is a partnership with schools, teachers and other universities. I'll explain how that works in a moment. And uh, the number of problems being solved fluctuates a bit, but a rough uh, average since uh, September is about 100,000 problems a week. Right. So here's, um, if you were to click on have a go, or questions, then you get to a filter, or eventually to a filter, where you can select your problems. And so you choose your problems. I've decided to illustrate here doing physics problems, but we have many hundreds of maths problems as well, because maths is so vital to our undertaking. Then you uh, choose a level, and you can't quite read that, but do go online. Um, level 1 is pre-AS, and level 6 is post-A2. So level 6 is something like the first year in Cambridge. 
and students should find their level between these uh, extremes and progress. And so you can take mechanics, and I'm interested in circular motion, and I want this at level four. So these are the choices I made. And that will be the default if I'm logged on and then come back again having done that. So um, there are 10 questions that are then revealed at <coughs> level four in circular motion for me to solve. And if I click on one of those, then the whole board is added to my activity, and I can return to that and uh, keep working at it slowly. Oh, and I forgot to mention a very important point. No, not yet. So, this is the vital point. Put the mouse down, pick up the pencil and paper. We try and subtly hint that by having a, 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 a pencil written, uh, you work it out there. I think that's far too subtle for kids, especially if there's a mouse. If it moves and it's coloured, they'll click it. So that, that we can work on that. We can reduce the number of clicks per, per minute or even second. We can uh, make various hurdles that you've got to do something before you, another click will be rewarded and so on. But anyhow, it's an important aspect. Physics is a cerebral activity. You saw me unpack that question. Unless you can do it, then it's not doing you any good. It's like asking somebody to do your piano practice for you. Right, so I put the mouse down, and so I've, ch I've gone to this problem here. I, I picked the speedometer on a bike wheel, and so a speedometer on a bike wheel, it's the question we go to, the question is posed, read it, not easy to read on the screen, and then uh, a bit more reading here, the particular aspect of the problem, and then you can answer, put your answer in there, it's got to be correct, including significant figures, the computer's extremely constipated and unforgiving about <laughs> figures. Students hate it, the teachers love it. And exam boards, we were asking only today, do, are they really sticklers for significant figures? They are. They're the people yeah. Okay, and then uh, you can check, get my, you have to specify some units, of course, it's a drop down menu of about eight randomly chosen units, including the right one as well and um, check my answer, and you get immediate uh, right, wrong or right, and you get feedback. You'll be told if you've made a common sort of error, you'll be told if actually the number's wrong, or you're almost there that significant figures are, are wrong. Um, and there, there are classic errors. We find them, we look at the big data and see how many people are getting a question wrong. We look at it and we discover why. Then it's, it's, there's a little gentle hint. Look carefully at the y-axis or something like that, and they realize it's milliseconds rather than seconds on the y-axis. And there are up to five levels of hint. None of the hints will tell you the answer. So we, we, don't, we don't give it away, but um, uh, uh, level three is a diagram, level five is um, a scribble video, typically, where somebody will speak for maybe 45 seconds, maybe sketching the important bits of the diagram, or otherwise giving um, uh, assistance. And there are related concepts, and there are related questions, so that if you want or need more um, activity in that area, or you have to build on some ideas, those ideas are given here. And they're also uh, given uh, or directed vaguely towards them in the hints. We think of making that more structured as well. Uh, that's another discussion. And last, but very much not least, uh, the source of the question is acknowledged. And it's quite hard to read it off the screen. It's a bit hard to read, but uh, when you're online, you see that this is one of Gillian's uh, questions, and it's, uh, it doesn't get any easier. To read. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're on the screen, it's crystal clear. Maybe a little small, but it's crystal clear. So uh, we are grateful to Cambridge Assessment. Cambridge Assessment gave us 17,000 of those. We haven't used them all, but they're I hope you, uh, um, from my enthusiasm and so on, there are some complete gems in there. And they are having another life in this digital um, age. Right. Then there's this book, which I've spoken about many times. Now, this book is uh, unique in the sense that it's coupled to the moon. So if you go to a page of this book, you will find questions, and those questions can all be answered on the moon. So this, although this book only costs you a pound, and it's got all this question in it, 
it's actually um, a very valuable resource indeed because there's a huge online edifice around it. There are 73 problem sets targeted at the principal A-level topics. The answers, uh, you can answer the problems online, you get feedback. The teachers can set the page of this relating to the topic they've just taught as homework, and the machine will mark them as simple <coughs> results. Um, it's got two parts, and the second part is um, by Lisa, and it's developing problem-solving skills. It has some worked examples, which is a valuable part of a, of a learning process to see the worked example. And it is a guide to the problems that we find on that filter. It's not so much a guide to this, um, it's not at all a guide to the core, to the core um, A level uh, master in physics uh, skills. And this book is the type of book and the material, the type of material needed for the new A levels, the new requirements of problem solving, use of maths, quantitative and qualitative understanding. So this is why teachers are very attracted to this, because it is the new target that they have to meet. Um, so that accounts for, its, I think, some of its popularity. So I went to page 22, which is chapter C, chapter C1, and you see this is a good example. There are some simple circuits here and questions about what is the resistance of this combination A here. So really, really simple stuff. Just resistors in series, so you add them. Um, there are some rather ominous decimal points there, 3.0 ohms. So you can imagine the significant figures machine is, is working through that. And kids learn relatively painlessly. Uh, they've, got to, um, they've got to do that. Um, the problems grow in complexity as you go down. And by the time you're at question 12, it's a really very beautiful problem about a high voltage transmission line through the countryside, which are strands of aluminium wire and copper wire woven together with different uh, resistivities. You're given the uh, diameter of these wires, uh, you can work out their resistance. They're in parallel, obviously, and then to find the overall resistance of 20 kilometers of cable, which is a real world problem of considerable importance. So they're beautifully graded and uh, get students to this point. So self-guided students can do this alone, and Isaac will mark and give some feedback. So um, it's not just the students who are in schools with specialist teachers, which are sadly not all students. The others have uh, some support here as well. So the question is the same as the ones that are on the um, online thing. Is that the idea? Uh, I showed you a route to problems, like the speedometer problem. Mm -hmm. And they are in a filter of problems which are more open-ended, more multi-stranded than these questions. Mm -hmm. So they are also online, but they're in a different place online. Okay. And, and they don't come together really. Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, you go for either. I mean, and they're readily accessible. Uh, but they're a different type of question. Mm -hmm. um, and they're more sort of underpinning the, the skills and fluency you need for A-level. So the author who's used these for many years, Anton Matichek, the principal author of the first part of the book, says that he routinely will get students who would otherwise get Ds and Cs up to um, up to even Bs and As, two grades. Up. It's a remarkable claim, and we will see how this delivers. I'll explain to you at the moment the interest part of this talk. Right, and for teachers, well. If you uh, register online, which is free, and then uh, apply to be a, a teacher, uh, have a teacher account, we will upgrade you after we've made sure you are a teacher and not some sinister person <coughs> preying on children. So it's, it's not automatic, but it's not a very high bar to pass. Um, and, uh, and then you'll get these features. And these features are you can set assignments. You can either take, go through this filter and get 10 questions on mechanics circular motion, and that collection is we call a board, that becomes one of yours, you can send it for your students. Or you can take a, a page from this book, which is set together, in this case 12 problems, I think there were, and that could be a collection you set that, or um, you just build it up for um, other colors. You just take, a, take problems and you want to put them together in one unit, and you can use those. Those are retained in your profile as a teacher, you can use them next year or with another parallel class. 
And then the problems are marked and the results are assembled. So here is an example. This is a women in STEM masterclass that um, I think it was I or Lisa ran this a few days ago. Um, we had uh, 26 uh, girls uh, coming, actually 25 girls, and um, they signed up, and this was the work that they were set before they came. So we were, uh, they joined this class, I was the teacher in a sense, um, I've cut the name of the class off to avoid embarrassment. The name of the board we set was something like Cambridge College Physics Entertainment Experience. Experience. Um, uh, uh, year 11. Um, so uh, there were some questions, about 10. This question here in this column was entitled Finding the Invisible. You'd find the other questions there. Um, 17 out of the 26 students correct, uh, correctly answered all of the questions before they came. And I could watch this accumulate in real time as a teacher would overnight when the students are doing the homework. And um, so in this column you have, um, across this row you have the name of the question and the percentage of the students who got the correct answer. Here you've got the students, so you can look across here and see, for instance, this student is not doing very well, only got two questions, only attempted two questions, and um, so uh, in the spirit of the flipped classroom, the next day you would um, look at this problem for um, remedial attention, and you would have a quiet word with this student here. And uh, Mr. Davies, who uh, is our front line in these things, will say a little bit about cheating, and uh, if he's asked uh, about, not that he cheats, but he <laughs> a little on cheat, cheating. Um, and the need actually to show working, and make sure that children do their working properly, and participate in the flipped classroom the next day. So, I've spoken about the use of exam and other materials um, in a MOOC, Massive Open Online Course. The C is perhaps rather marginal, but that's what we call it. And there's a related form. Now, the face-to-face -face, uh, physics with students is done <coughs> in classes in schools. Typically, several schools come together and contribute uh, students to this class. It could be between two and four hours. The questions are not on the MOOC. They are real special sheets that uh, we've all contributed to, and the uh, people who run this in the first instance, Ali Davis, who's in the audience, uh, is a full-time uh, former teacher who's with us. Uh, he is our public face, and Heather Peck is not here, and she is uh, part-time. They're both very experienced teachers. Um, they go to the hub schools. They have partner teachers who come from here. And Isaac Physics finances this and organises it organises the students, it provides the material, it has electronic registration and all of that. And uh, the model is that the partner teachers actually run these themselves. And Ali is not in every one of these hundreds of events that's going on, but he and Heather have set this up so that these partner teachers can manage it. There's no way in which we can reach 100,000 students, just the two or three of us. It has to be with our partner schools and teachers. And these partners, well, we have CPD, full or half day, or residential, it's free, there are materials to take away, and some of the teachers who come to this, some don't become partners, but they teach, they use this material in their schools, others become partner teachers, we pay them for the courses that they run, and they are involved here. So, um, in the last um, couple of years or so, about 700 teachers have uh, participated. And this is the reach uh, through England and Wales since uh, uh, September. And like the British Empire, the sun never sets the light. It's painted right around the world. And different intensity in different places. Even, uh, for instance, Fiji. Right. So let me uh, conclude now by looking at some statistics and then uh, look into the future. Um, so this was a snapshot taken on the 7th of April. So remember that date because there's some strange things following. It was a day I took the snapshot. It was during the Easter vacation when I was writing this uh, talk. Um, you see that we have about 21,000 students registered by then. They're registering at a rate of 500 a week, so it used to be somewhat out of date. 
um, that we have um, uh, about, um, uh, where are the teachers? Here, about 1,350 teachers that we did at least then. Um, we think there are some teachers loitering in here that haven't converted to teacher status, um, but um, you know, they're welcome to just try the problems and enjoy them. Um, these groups, these are these, like these group of girls that I created as a teacher and watched them doing their homework. Well, there's getting on for 2,000 of those that teachers have created during, uh, um, throughout the country. And these groups are then set for the year or two years that did this teacher. And um, they are a conduit for homework and, and, and so on. And um, there's uh, been about 320 of these hub events and um, CPD sessions. So it's on quite a, a large scale. And we can keep track of everything that happens. But in, in, in particular here, there were 41 teachers and 745 students seen in the last seven days. Well, that was in the depth of the vacation. And before um, uh, yesterday, we looked at what, well, OK, so let me just conclude this. Teachers and students are engaging with this, but there's a long way to go. Um, 100,000 problems a week. You might say, well, there's 100,000 ASNA2 students nationally. There's only one problem a week each. Well, that's not good. They should be doing 10. So and it's clearly a tenth of those are doing ten problems. It's, it's not a full group. But let's look forward, or let's look to today, or yesterday. So this was the vacation. This was the day that I took the snapshot. There were 5,000 questions asked that day. And then, uh, and then on, this continued through the uh, Friday of the holidays, on the Saturday of the holidays, on the Sunday, the number doubled because they're going back to school the next day, and uh, and then on the uh, on the Tuesday, uh, Sunday, Monday, there was uh, ten and a half thousand. Tuesday, there was nine thousand. They're relaxing a little bit. There were eight thousand six hundred yesterday. But if you gross that up to a month, it's something like a quarter of a million problems uh, a month. Now it could have something to do with exams. Exams are only. What, six weeks away? I don't, know. I, I don't care as, as profoundly as they do, but clearly there's something on that horizon. And that's good. We're there to help. Okay, so I hope I've tried to address the question of hard, and it's got quotation marks now, because I don't believe in hard in any absolute sense. And the questions are an aspect of hard, because they are hard to do questions. You've got to do deconstruction diagrams. So. And they are different aspects of learning and understanding. So now I've really got to um, address the other bit, which is getting them interested. Now, I hope these figures that I've shown you show that there is some interest, quite feverish interest sometimes. But um, why? Well, I don't think you should ever underestimate the curiosity and intellectual ambitions of students. You meet students who are incredibly ambitious intellectually and that they want to do a subject that they perceive as hard for the challenge. Uh, many aspire to Russell Group STEM and their entrance requirements, and they know about that. Their parents know about that, and they are concerned about a level results. The MOOC um, is ideal for lone wolf students without specialist physics teachers, the ones that are uh, sort of drifting uh, because they don't have an extra physics teacher to guide them. And there are quite a lot of such students around. Um, girls are more self-motivated and independent than boys. This is well known. And um, the MOOC is ideal for them. They can work at their own speed. They can make mistakes without people commenting on it or being deprecated. So I'm quite happy to tell you that after a week on holiday, I'm absolutely useless and I make terrible mistakes and I would be embarrassed. But I've got a really thick skin compared to, say, a 15-year-old girl. And we believe that this is significant for uh, the gender issue. Well, at least it gives girls a good space to work in. And it presents the style of physics, maths, and engineering that will be needed at university. Teachers, well, teachers have professional pride. And they really do like problem solving. A lot of them will say, well, I haven't really done this for years, and it's terribly difficult, hard. 
Uh, but they come to the CPD and they sit at tables with us and they solve problems. And I was very, very nervous at this when we started this uh, program because I thought, you know, one doesn't want to put colleagues, I mean, the teachers are our most valuable colleagues, on the spot for anything. But they really go to hope and most of them really like this. So they do it, they see it as professional development. It's unique in educational initiatives in that it actually sets out to halve the work of the teachers rather than double it. And most uh, innovation usually is on the cost of the poor teachers. Mm. So we're actually offering them something that's in labor saving, it allows them to flip the classroom, get the kids to do the hard stuff or the repetitive stuff at home, and they're not having to do the marking. They just scrutinize the working and they see in the moment what's going on, but they're not doing this endless marking. Um, they are concerned about the new A-level requirements. Um, there's a free MOOC and free CPD, and the books are almost free. And the Master in Physics book, we hope, will have a strong effect <coughs> on A-level results. We know which schools these books are being used in and problems being solved on the web. Um, the government publishes uh, um, time series results for each school, and we can see, we will go to the these and see whether there are jumps in performance in the schools coupled to the use of these, uh, these materials. So we, we hope to actually drill down into this with the big data that we possess. And universities are quite interesting. They can use the MOOC remotely as preparation and then also during outreach activities. And Lisa and I routinely have 350 students in one of the law faculty um, uh, lecture theatres and they have done their homework before they come, and then we have 350 of them there, all solving problems. The teacher stands up and says, do take out your mobile phone, but feel free to use them. And they've never heard this from a teacher before, so uh, it's quite good. Um, the universities are extremely interested and concerned about the problem of girls in STEM, and we are working uh, with up to 10 other universities by actually having um, Isaac Physics fellows installed in those, like there are Ogden fellows installed in the outreach uh, departments of other universities. And the, this tool, the universities are attracted um, by it because it addresses the accessibility issue, even for disadvantaged students. So let me conclude now by what I see as the, the sort of issues. <coughs> How does one do assessment in this arena? Because after all, I've been, uh, I've been proposing examining concepts, looking at diagram drawing, looking at multi-step analysis. And so you really, I think, want to assess that in the way that it was uh, before. Um, I think that will be related to whether one has internationally competitive exams and materials. Um, I, you be clear from what I've said uh, that I believe that the examination has a huge role to play in the setting of standards and setting the aims of physics courses. Actually, all courses, but physics is my area. And it relates school education to the activities and requirements of industry and of the universities. Um, can one look to new tools in assessment? Well, I haven't actually said a lot about the sophisticated things that our six computer scientists are doing, but they can recognize and interpret diagrams. Uh, that's an Isaac physics tool that I think Quite exciting. Um, it can, uh, the machine can mark multi step ana uh, 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 analysis of problems and it can mark an analytic result. The answer is e to the 2x or something like that. It will read that, interpret it. So it's not just numbers that it's interpreting, it's also um, symbols. Um, can one do continual assessment? We suddenly put out a word to uh, schools that this afternoon at 2 o'clock uh, students should be sitting in front of a school computer and there will be an assessment. And how do you manage the security of that? 